the, 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 the con concept of an ice age has held popular culture in its frigid grasp. Great saber-toothed cats, woolly mammoths, massive glaciers. It all sounds so exciting, almost like another world entirely. According to leading evolutionary ideas, many ice ages have occurred throughout Earth's history. I'm not so convinced. In fact, dozens of theories have been presented as explanations, and they all seem to be on pr pretty thin ice. We need more than glacial guesswork. Was there an ice age? More than one? How does an ice age even occur? And how long could it last? Well, the g good news is that answers do exist. Let's find out more on today's episode of Creation Connection. Welcome to Creation Connection. I'm Michael. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. You ready? Let's go. Before we tackle any of the other questions, we need to figure out what exactly an ice age is. The answer isn't particularly complex. An ice age refers to a time when large sheets of ice and glaciers cover a great deal of the Earth's surface. A scientist's worldview heavily affects what he or she believes about the concept of ice ages. Most experts in this field subscribe to a worldview known as uniformitarianism. Uniformitarian scientists claim that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old and that during that long stretch of time, at least five major ice ages have occurred. They also believe that the fifth major ice age happened more recently, 2.6 million years ago. I mean, that's practically yesterday in the evolutionary timescale. The evidence suggests that the ice sheets we have today once extended into lower latitudes. But a strong case can be made for only one ice age. Scientists look at striations found in rock and conclude that the striations have been caused by moving glaciers. But a number of scientists disagree on whether glaciers formed these scratches or if there are more plausible explanations, like underwater landslides. Alongside the exceptionally feeble evidence for so many major ice ages, scientists must also explain just how these ice ages occurred, which leads me to So, the Milankovitch theory is probably the most popular ice age theory among uniformitarian scientists. It involves a lot of math and a lot of guesswork, but I'm not really interested in smashing my forehead against a brick wall right now, and I certainly don't want you to suffer through that either. So I'll just give you the brief summary. This is the sun, and this is the earth. Full disclosure, my visual illustration is not to scale, but you'll just have to roll with it. The Earth's axis is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, but due to gravitational influences from other celestial bodies, the Earth's tilt actually changes by a few degrees over time. Simply put, the Earth wobbles. These wobbles take a long time to complete. If you start a timer when the tilt is at exactly 23.5 degrees and watch it wobble, the Earth will return to its original tilt in about 41,000 years. And that's not all. The Earth also wobbles like a spinning top, and that wobble makes a complete cycle in about 26,000 years. Finally, there is a third wobble. The Earth's orbit around the Sun changes slightly over time. It actually wobbles from a circular shape to an oval and back again. That complete cycle takes 100,000 years to complete. Because of these wobbles, there are times when some places on Earth receive more or less sunlight than normal. And the Milankovitch theory proposes that this wobble is responsible for the ice ages. Here's the kicker. Creation scientists actually acknowledge these wobbles 
and don't necessarily disagree with the mathematics and astronomical aspects of these equations. But the Milankovitch theory calculations assume that the solar system is billions of years old, and some of those age assumptions were later changed by evolutionists. One of the age estimates that convinced many scientists that the Milankovitch theory is correct was later changed by 80,000 years, enough to invalidate the original results. That's a big difference. And large enough to call this theory into question. But the biggest issue facing Milankovitch is that these changes in sunlight distribution are incredibly small in the grand scheme of things, certainly too small to affect any real change. Astronomer Fred Hoyle put it best, if I were to assert that a glacial condition could be induced in a room liberally supplied during winter with charged night storage heaters simply by taking an ice cube into the room, the proposition would be no more unlikely than the Milankovitch theory. Quickly, quickly, I must be careful. Where is he? What? Is it here? Did you find it? Yes. Patience, please. This is quite dangerous. Yes. Turn on the heaters. It is done. I have found it. The Milankovitch Ice Cube. With this, we can rule the world! Yes, we can! Careful! Careful! This don't, is quite dangerous! Don't patronize me! I bumped it up! The leading uniformitarian theory cannot satisfactorily explain one ice age, but there is an alternative. Oddly enough, the Bible records an event that provides all the components necessary for an ice age, the Genesis Flood. ICR physicist and ice age expert, Dr. Jake Hebert can tell us more about the heat model. So what do you need for an ice age? If I had to just give you a one sentence requirement, you need to keep snow and ice from melting for many consecutive years. So you need two things, you need colder summers, but you also need heavy snowfall. Well, we creationists think that the flood that occurred in the days of Noah gives us a very straightforward mechanism for providing those two things. We're gonna use a little acrostic heat to help people remember the key points, okay? The H stands for hot oceans, the E stands for evaporation, the A stands for these sulfuric acid droplets, what we call aerosols. That gives you the cooling effect you need to keep the snow and ice from melting, and the T stands for time. Simple enough, right? We've got hot oceans from the formation of an entirely new seafloor from lava, which results in increased evaporations. This results in greater snowfall, one of the two necessary components of an ice age. Aerosols from hundreds of volcanic eruptions keep temperatures cool during the summers, the second necessary component. Then, over time, the ice sheets grow. That leads to an important question. If there was an ice age after the flood, what about all the people that lived through it? Well, an ice age does not require the entire Earth to be a frozen ball of ice. In fact, creation scientists and uniformitarian scientists agree that during the most recent ice age, or should I say the only ice age, that only about 30% of the Earth's land surface was covered, compared to about 10% today. Glaciers didn't extend to the Middle East where nearly all biblical history occurred. Interestingly enough, the ice age and the increased rainfall that came along with it could also help explain why portions of the Middle East that are arid desert today were described as being quite fertile. The biblical chronology gives the time and mechanism for a single ice age, not four or five or however many more uniformitarian scientists can conceive of to try to make their timeline work. The ice age began 4,500 years ago, soon after the Genesis flood. This is consistent with the geological evidence. Because glacial features have experienced little erosion, Creation and uniformitarian scientists agree that the last ice age, really the only ice age, occurred just thousands of years ago. Although they disagree about the precise date, creation scientists estimate, based on the times needed for the oceans to cool down and for the ice sheets to melt, 
that the post-flood ice age lasted about 700 years. The book of Job records events that occurred just a few generations after the flood, and it contains more frost-filled language than any other book in the Bible. Consider the following passages. Have you entered the treasury of snow, or have you seen the treasury of hail? From whose womb comes the ice? And the frost of heaven, who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. While it's not conclusive proof, it certainly sounds like Job is familiar with icy conditions. So what's the point? That's a valid question. Let me break it down. Creation scientists and uniformitarian scientists both believe that there is ample evidence for at least one ice age. But the worldview from which they approach a possible ice age is incredibly different. Uniformitarians take the evidence they see and try to craft a theory to fit their 4.6 billion year timeline. And that theory is rife with issues. Even other uniformitarians admit that the model presented is powerless to produce what the evidence supposedly represents. The heat model, on the other hand, fits superbly within the biblical chronology and can explain the evidence that we see with very little guesswork. Tell us why this is so critical, Dr. Hebert. This isn't just relevant to the creation evolution controversy. It has real world consequences even in everyday life. In order for us to correctly understand future climate change, you've got to accurately understand past climate change. If the Genesis flood really is what caused the Ice Age, we're not gonna have another Ice Age because God promised that there would never again be another flood to destroy the world. Thanks for watching Creation Connection. New episodes drop on Wednesdays. If you want to dig into Dr. Hebert's work, make sure to check out the Ice Age and Climate Change. A link is in the description. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. More resources can be found at icr.org. It'd be cool of you to like, subscribe, and share. We'll see you next time on Creation Connections.